Hello, and welcome to Wonderstruck. I am your host, Elizabeth Rovier. I'm a clinical psychologist, a yoga teacher, and a graduate of Harvard Divinity School. I'm really curious about our experiences of wonder and awe and how they transform us. My guest today is Sravana Borkataki Varma. Born in Assam, India, Sravana is a fellow at Harvard Divinity School's Center for the Study of World Religions and an active board member and teacher at Esalen Institute. Her main focus is on esoteric rituals and gender in Hindu traditions. She's currently working on several upcoming books, including Divinized Divas, Superwomen, Wives, Hidras, and Hindu Shakta Tantra. From early childhood, Sravana experienced both clairvoyance and clairaudience. She sees and hears things others cannot perceive. At eight years old, mindful of these gifts, she began her initiation into the Tantra tradition. She continues to practice Hindu Shakta Tantra and educate others about Tantra's true meaning. Sravana is here to set the record straight pushing back against the perception that Tantra is merely about sexual performance. Coming up, Sravana unpacks what Tantra really is, why it matters, and what it has helped her understand about life, death, and seeking out harmony and liberation. So I think perhaps maybe we should start with Tantra, um, maybe you could explain to our audience what is Tantra, what is it not, and what is specific about Hindu Shakta Tantra? Hmm. So first of all, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you for uh, inviting me to this wonderful podcast. It's an honor. Um, so I would like to begin there. Um, what is Tantra? Uh, <laughs> it is one of the most contested terms, I would say, in uh, in the history, or uh, it's one of the top 10, I would say, contested terms, uh, mm. because it has a very, very complex history. Uh, and this history goes for s thousands of years. And then in that big history, I call there is a pizza effect, mm. where there's a lot that happened with the transmission. So what where we are today with the term Tantra uh, needs to be teased out in in a true sense of the way. But at the same time, uh, not everyone needs to be a scholar of Tantra and do a PhD and figure this history. Um, so how I kind of understand and explain Tantra is that first, as long as we acknowledge that it's a complex history. Um, so that is really, really important to begin with. Uh, it's a path. It's a way of living. Mm. Uh, that does not mean there is only one path or one way of living. It is one way among many paths. It does not saying the other paths are less or other paths are more. And I say this very intentionally because in Tantra, in some schools of Tantra, there is this understanding that Tantra is a higher path. It is meant for people with a certain persona, a certain level of astute um, um, sense of what human and macrocosm and microcosm are. And when we do this higher path, by default, we are saying there's a lower path. And by that, what we're doing is we are, we are kind of putting a divide in the spiritual path. And so I'm very cognizant of that, and that's why I would say it's one path. Right. And it is a path, it's a choice. This path has another feature, which is there is there are certain rituals and there are certain texts that inform us about how our human body is connected mm -hmm. to the divine body. Again, that mm -hmm. does not mean that other paths don't have it, but this has certain unique features, and that's where historically the definitions come up. There are just so many definitions. So when I was doing my PhD, my advisor said, I did my PhD with Jeffrey Kripal at Rice University, and he said, Shravna, you can't be a scholar practitioner and not have a definition for tantra. <laughs> 
crisis, classic PhD dissertation crisis <laughs> moment, right? I think I spent eight months not writing anything <laughs> because I could not find it, figure out a definition. And it has taken me some time, but to come to what is not Tantra, I would first like to define what is Tantra. So I define Tantra in a much more broader sense of the way. I say if there are these four features, and all four have to be present for me to mm. say there is this Tantra. Number one, the human body, including the bodily fluids, are not rejected. Number two, there is an active practice, active engagement of the subtle body. Mm. And whatever that subtle body looks like for you in your tradition, whatever names you use, whatever terms you use, those can change. For example, in our tradition, we do a lot of breath work, breath, breath holding, nadis, the, the channels, the chakras come into play. Now, there could be a tradition that has a different understanding of the subtle body because it is plural. It is not uh, you know, one definition. Mm -hmm. Number three, there is some kind of a tool that you will use, mantra and a mandala, mantra or a yantra. <clears throat> but there is, a, there is a, a, a tool that you will use to intentionally, and intentionality is extremely important here, intentionally to enter the macrocosm and intentionally to exit the macrocosm. Mm. So the intentionality is key. And the fourth element is um, liberation is possible in this lifetime, Jivana Mukti. Mm -hmm. So if you have these four elements in your practice, it could be religious, it could be spiritual, it could be both, it could be neither, mm. I would say it's Tantra. Mm. So then it can apply to Christian traditions, is Islamic traditions, Hindu traditions, Buddhist traditions, Jain traditions, Sikh traditions. So it's really up to that particular practice set that can become Tantra. And historically, we know that Tantra ha is present in many, many traditions. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, it seems like <clears throat> such an incredibly ancient, profound practice mm -hmm. that it, it, it comes, it, it is quite ancient, and then it was taken into Hinduism or Buddhism or aspects perhaps of Christi Christian mysticism, I'm not sure. I'm, a, I'm not an expert in Christian mysticism, but from where I stand, what I see, how I teach it, I see it everywhere. Mm, you see uh, it everywhere. I see it everywhere. It's just that, that that's what comes to the transmission somehow for a very complex history, Tantra gets understood as in the context of sex. Because is this because of the body? Because you're you're saying the body is that which is also sacred. The bodily fluids are sacred. Yes. Also, I think in the 1800s with the Theosophists and the Theosophical mm -hmm. interpretation, and then all the teachers that came to this. So it's not just the West interpretation, but also what the Eastern teachers did when they came to the West. It got taught in a very, very certain mm -hmm. particular way, especially in the 1950s, 60s. It, it got taught and the culture absorbed it in a very, in a, in a tiny mm -hmm. little sliver. Mm -hmm. And that became Tantra. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why many people don't want to use the term. Yeah. Uh, many people, sh you know, stay away from the term. And then also why people like us, we get branded. Uh, it happened to me in Facebook. I was banned from <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> Ooh, that's exciting. I know, right? <laughs> uh, because I was teaching my the course title. I was going to teach this on um, through Internet. The course title was a, god, a goddess, right? And mm -hmm. uh, Shakta Tantra. And Facebook kept sending me emails after email <laughs> saying, I'm selling pornography. <laughs> Oh and God. I I got so mad. I oh wrote to God. anybody and everybody I could get a hold of in an email saying, this is exactly <laughs> why this course is needed. Uh, but to clarify what's correct. what's really what this is really about correct. and how it's so much more than some kind of like hippie sex practice from the 50s. Exactly. And that's absurd. You said once it was making it made me laugh that it's as if talking about Catholicism was about self-flagellation. Exactly. <laughs> right. It is not. It's and, not. And, and how did I become a prostitute? But apparently, <laughs> oh, my God, for Facebook, I'm like, you know, doing wow. whatever I was doing. But I think so. So it really comes down to 
Therefore, this is for me tantra. Yes, there are elements of sexual practices. I'm not saying there aren't. I'm not saying in the in the path of tantra there are no rituals or texts that talk about the sexual practices or sexual fluids, but they are all generated for accessing the microcosm, mm. accessing the divine, or accessing the divine inside of us, or identifying the divine inside of us. It's it's the classic, I see you, you see me, and in it's this so divine way. So that's Tantra. Mm. It's so beautiful, and it's also accepting of the whole, the whole picture. It's not just as though this is acceptable, this is what's good enough for spirituality or God. Mm-hmm. It's like all of you, mm-hmm. everything is. Mm-hmm. Totally. And and doesn't <clears throat> matter what gender identity we take. Mm-hmm. Everything is. This this is a, you know, but at the same time, the human body is also not a playground. Of course, right? And that is very, um, very kind of more unique to mm. Tantra and needs to be emphasized because when mm. we understand the human body in this context of neo-tantra, which is more focused on sex and sexual fulfillment and finding the divine through sexual fulfillment, somewhere we forget how Mm. sacred the human body is. Right. And so it's not a playground. Yeah, I would think that any of these practices would be done with reverence Mm. and and an aspect of the sacred. It's not Mm -hmm. about, as you said, a playground. What what is the what distinguishes um, Shakta Tantra from Tantra? Um, <clears throat> at a very fundamental level, I would say there is no difference. So Shiva okay. Tantra, sh- you know, uh, Shakta Tantra. Um, then there is the Sri Vidya tradition. I think we are all operating kind of on the same foundation. However, in Shakta Tantra, the goddess kind of becomes the front and center. Mm. So we operate with the Dasa Mahavityas, the 10 great wisdom goddesses, as they are called. The 10 great wisdom goddesses. I love right. that. Right. And, but then it's not like they're just 10. So I'll give an example <laughs> of Kali. And the reason I bring Kali, because I think Kali is the most well-known globally. She's like a global yes. uh, goddess, right? Um, now, I get students who would be like, oh, I love Kali. Kali appeared to me. I want to cultivate a relationship with Kali. And my first question is, which Kali? And they're looking mm, at me like, huh? Wow. Like, what are you even talking about? I was like, no, there are many personas of Kali, mm. right? Like us. I'm not one persona. I have right. so many different aspects of me. And so Kali can be maternal Kali, can be a warrior Kali, can be yeah. um, uh, 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 somebody who who is benevolent. Uh, and, and, you know, there could be so many different forms of Kali. So which wow. Kali would you want to have a relationship, quote unquote, with yes, in this yes. context? So, so in Shakti tan- Shakta Tantra, the goddess becomes front and center. So you the kind God. of, she becomes your lead person, and then she becomes you, you become her. And that's the, mm. that's the dissolving that we are trying to achieve. The, about the divine coming in mm. and you going into the divine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And at some point, there is no separation. And at some point, there's no, that's profound. And so is that t- a type of visualization practice, or is, does it involve mantra? Can you talk about? I mean, because I know that some of it's deemed esoteric or more <laughs> secret. Is it possible to talk about some of mm-hmm. these practices? So I do want to talk about secrecy a little bit, and okay. then I will talk about um, uh, maybe a few practices. Um, I have thought about secrecy a ton. Mm. It, it means a lot to me because I am an initiate. Mm. Uh, I am an, ins- you know, from that standpoint, secrecy comes up a lot. What I've come to understand is there are two elements to secrecy. One is pure hyper masculinity, patriarchy, oh. me- because these traditions were largely taught by men, mm. for men, by men. So there's an enormous element of, um, <coughs> as I said, hyper masculinity, power, 
and trying to hold on to that space. Then there is the capitalist and the neoliberal aspects of it, because then with power comes money. Um, that All those elements that gets clubbed as secrecy, and they say, don't tell anyone this, I've decided to speak about it in public. Because I'm like, I am done with you guys. Like, I am done, mm. right? So I am going to bring it out. I am going to teach it. I am going to talk about it. And mm. I am going to give my students access to these practices. Mm. But there is also secrecy that I keep for myself. Yes. And that is what I've come to realize is there are stages to the practice. So it's not like I don't want to give my one of my students the next level practice. I am not going to give it because they're not ready. Right. They're not ready. It it could create a bigger fracture in them or they, mm -hmm. they may not understand the depths of it. And so they may see that saying, oh, I am trying to keep this a secret, but it is not secret. It is just that it'll be very irresponsible of me mm -hmm. to, you know, like, you know, if, if a child is six years old, you don't talk about all topics because they're not right. ready for right. it, right? There is a time and a place and a mm -hmm. progression. So with that, um, when it comes to certain uh, practices, when we get initiated, we are given, uh, we call it Ishtadevi, the mm -hmm. cherished des a de a goddess. Um, it could be a god, it could be... Uh, you know, a, a, a third gender uh, divinity, but you're given one divine being. Uh, the way it works is you. there will be a teacher who will say a mantra, in your, whisper mm. a mantra in your ear once. Ooh. And you have to repeat it by hearing it once. Mm. If you get it, then it's meant for you. If it's not, if you don't get it, like if you if you forget it or you couldn't repeat <coughs> it correctly, then this is not the right time oh. for you. Oh wow! And so you can see where the yes, power yes. and secrecy and all of these things come mm -hmm, up, right? Mm -hmm. Because somebody can say it f in a certain rhythm and you didn't get it, or it was too loud. But you can see how yes. complex it is. At the same time, how sacred it is. Yes. Right. So um, we're given a mantra and. Again, it is persona driven. Sometimes it could be one syllable or mm. it could be 50 seat syllables that is it, there in the mantra. That's right? so long. Yes. So it is uh, It is decided at that moment. And there are many things that go. You know, it's not like you just show up and they give you a mantra, right? You have lots of conversations mm. before that. You do a lot of reading before that. You do mm. a lot. So there's a lot of prep before that. Mm -hmm. um, then you're given a mantra, and then you're given a set of instructions of how now you will engage with mm. the divine. And strangely... With, with the divine sorry. through the particular god, goddess, transgender deity. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. And how will you engage? Because remember I said it's intentional engagement. Yes, yes. It is not accidental engagement, right? So how will you do it? Now, those rituals look very different for different people. Fascinating. Um, and then also within the, uh, like, Shakta Tantra, there will be some formats that are similar. Then there are some that are completely different. Okay. So, for example, for certain people, they would be told, okay, you do this, this, this in the morning, right? You do this mantra maybe 50 times or 151 times or 108 mm -hmm. times. You um, you pray to the goddess this way. You know, you meditate this way. And then for me, for example, I was very clearly given the instruction that don't regiment your set of rituals. Mm. I apparently, and I'll tell you why I say apparently, because I tried to also regiment. I was like, mm, <laughs> why do I have to list it all? You know, I, I, you, yeah, okay, that's my persona. But um, so I was told you need to have a set of rituals. I do fasting certain times in the year. Okay. I do certain rituals very, you know, in a very strict fashion mm -hmm. certain times in the year. But for the majority of the year, I can walk my dog and I mm -hmm. will say my mantra. I will cook. I will do laundry. I will drive. I will do my mm -hmm. breaths a certain way from traffic light to traffic light. Wow. Um, and then I was like, oh, wait, Ooh. maybe 
if I do the rigid way, maybe I will get somewhere else. Hey, you know, it's like the grass oh, is yeah, greener yeah, yeah, on the yeah. other side. Like, why did they say no to me? <laughs> and so for almost two years, I tried to the, the other side. It was such a disaster. <laughs> it was so bad, Elizabeth. I cannot tell you. It was so bad. And so then I went to my... Um, my my first teacher passed away, so I now have a second teacher. And I w- went to my second teacher. He's like, who asked you to do it? I said, because I thought, like, you know, maybe you guys are, like, not give, giving me the whole, you know, manual of sorts. <laughs> and no, so, so, so there are certain rituals that we do. There are certain fasting we do. So, for mm-hmm. example, you know, Shivratri is coming up very soon, um, which is uh, a, a day of fasting, especially in the night. We try not to sleep that night, right? Oh. Because we believe the portal is open. Mm. And the portal is open because the way the planets, the sun and the moon are aligned, because it's a lunar calendar, right? Mm-hmm. We follow the lunar calendar. The way it's aligned, it's a very big opening of the portal so we want to maximize that i do very intense mm-hmm. nine day fasting uh, wow. for the goddess called in, during navratri and when i say intense like i would eat maybe one fruit a day sometimes wow. just a few almonds a day and it's perfectly fine like i don't faint or, or so far i've not fainted but we'll see um but you know so those are there, so there are certain mm-hmm. times of the year i'm very 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 strict um, but then there are times in the year I'll just go with the flow. Mm-hmm. And the practices are daily, as, it, as you're saying. Yes. And I heard you once say to, I think it was Seth Powell on his yoga stu- on the Yoga Studies podcast, you said, you know, I don't even know how many times I repeat my mantra. It's just like my breath. Yes. I am just, it's just almost a constant Correct. experience. And I thought that was so beautiful and it made me, Again, also think about how, you know, you were initiated. You came to the tradition at eight years old. Right. I mean, which is profound, which right. is in and, of it, in and of itself is a, an incredible story, which I think would be a beautiful thing for our listeners to mm. hear as well, that, you know, I understand you were having visions and experiences as a child mm-hmm. that you brought to your parents and then also in your astrological chart. Mm-hmm. It said she's destined to be a guru. <laughs> And and have a temple, <laughs> and have no. a temple. I mean, that is and that's an an amazing thing that yeah. you were, you were saying that that is a phenomenon that happens not on, in an Assam, I guess, where people get their astrological chart at I would, birth. Mm, I would say for a majority of the Hindu families, yeah, it's nothing to do with the state. Okay, um, I think it's a religious aspect. I guess so. I would mm-hmm. want to say that. But if I say religious, somebody will come after me saying, okay. oh, it's not religious, it's spiritual, cultural, or it's cultural <laughs> social. I call it the sociocultural DNA of Hindu society. Okay. Let's just put that it that makes way. sense. That's yes. very encompassing. That's good. Yes, yes. <laughs> sociocultural DNA. It's It covers all my bases. Um, yes. So, um, yeah, I've been in this path now for, I'll be 48 this year. So, uh, 40 years mm-hmm. uh, I've been in this path. So cool. Yeah. And... Um, so I, yes, absolutely. Um, it started with, um, I would, what I have come to understand as clairaudience or clairvoyance. Mm-hmm. So I would get very clear messages and, mm-hmm. or a very clear vision. And these would be for someone. Um, and before that comes, there is a ve- two very atypical bodily, physical body sensation that happens. So it's almost like mm-hmm. I know it's coming. And uh, one of them, I'm pretty chilled and I can deal with it. Another sensation, I'm, I, I, it's not my favorite, but it's not like you get to choose. Um, so it started very, very well, can, early. Wait, can you tell us what is the sensation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of them is, you know, the way I can describe it, and I think language doesn't do it justice for of it, course. but I'll try my best. It feels like you have goosebumps or chills, but uh. from every cell in your body from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head and it doesn't go away it'll stay for days together sometimes oh my goodness and i don't mind that it's it i i don't you know i i'm like oh okay cool like you know i I know what it is i know what it is and i don't feel i don't lose my balance i i mean i feel i can still manage Mm. my life and the other one is 
you know, if you're driving in a highway or a freeway and you have a little bit of the wind open and you have that whoosh, whoosh, whoosh sound and it yes. hits your ears yes. a certain way, I don't like that one because mm. then that stays for days and wow. I feel very disoriented. Mm. That is the time when I can't find you know, way to my own home. If mm. I'm walking, I would have walked for two and a half hours and I'll be in a part of a city. I'm like, oh, what, where am oh, I? Wow. So thanks to Google Maps now and <laughs> smartphones, I, I, I'm much better. But uh, so, so these are two very distinct signs for me saying, mm. okay, this is going to happen now. And then I don't control if it's going to happen within an hour or it can take two days or three days. Um, there is no there is no mechanism for me to gauge that. So this started very early on and continues. But of course, in 40 years, it become much more comfortable, I guess. Of course. And at that time, my only way out was to go tell my parents that, hey, like this is happening. And I was much more closer to my dad. Uh, so I would, I would call him Baba. So I would go to Baba and tell him. So, you know, I think the frequency had changed increased quite a bit and so we are from Assam and therefore so I'm guessing if you we were we were from Tamil Nadu we would gone to another temple in mm. south of India right I mean but he that is where I went but you would see things and hear things and then tell your dad dad that this is going to happen this is gonna, could yeah. you, like for is there an example it could be like I would wake up and say so and so has died and oh. then, you know, at that time, we didn't have phones or internet, so the telegram will come saying so-and-so has died, right? Oh, wow. Or so-and-so uh, -so, um, is going to get into an accident, and we need to tell them to be careful or whatever. Right. And these were really times before any kind the of internet, uh, internet aspect, yeah. and, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so, you know, it was, so it would be very clear messages like that. Uh, were you comfortable with it? Like, were you kind of like, was it jarring? Or were you like, oh, this happened, I gotta go tell my dad? How did he respond? I think I was very blessed. I am very blessed, Elizabeth. Mm. I cannot tell you how blessed I am to have family, friends who have accepted me for who I am. And when I was young, for them to not make a big deal out of it mm. or to shun it. Yes. Right? Neither. It was like, oh, okay, again? All right. <laughs> Let's move on. Let's go to school. You know, right? Okay, like, you know, it's time to go to school. So it was very normalized for me to a point where I thought everybody got them. Like, That's I didn't cool. I didn't realize there was anything different about mm. me. I mean, now when I, you know, as a mother and have gone through that process, I was a weird child. Like, I was that <laughs> You know, that, that child in kindergarten who's dancing by themselves and have, <laughs> you know, imaginary friends. Yeah, I was that. <laughs> um, but at that time, I didn't know there was anything wrong with that kind of or that uh, it was existence. Yeah, that it was unusual or yeah. exceptional in some nothing, way. Mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing. It was so normalized. And so mm. that's when I got initiated at mm. the age of eight. And life went on. I don't remember much of that initiation. I only remember what my father then you know, kind of relayed. Huh. I think I was too yeah. young. So can you explain what initiation means? So, okay, so what does initiation mean? Initiation means you're now being brought to the path, right? And to bring you to the path, there is, and as, as I said, there are many levels of initiation, but this is to say, here's how you begin. So you then get initiated not only into the path, but also into a particular tradition and then also into a lineage. So it's not, mm. it's not, so yes, it is Tantra, Shakta Tantra, Kamakya, which is the lineage, and then your teacher. So you actually take initiation into, it's kind of like the threefold refuge of Buddha, right? Buddha and Sharnanga Chami and Dharma So, so the, the three, the three. So, uh, I take refuge in Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. So here, similarly, we are initiated into the Tantra way of being in the Tantra path. But that is that means nothing. So now comes the goddess, so that comes becomes your, your freeway. And then you come into your toll road. So that becomes your lineage, your gurus, and 
your teachers and your texts. I do remember my 15. That was the next yes. step. So there are lots of stages in initiation. Okay. It's not like you when you get initiated and that's it, right? Mm -hmm. So there are multi-stage process. As mm -hmm. I said, it's like you go from elementary school to middle to high to whatever, right? Um, mm -hmm. I remember my 50, the the uh, thing on 15 years. That I remember very clearly and very distinctly. Was uh, that when you got the mantra, or was that no mantra was given at eight? At eight, wow. uh, this was the next level where uh, the next set of rituals were going to be taught to me, Ooh. and um, it was done without fanfare uh, because my parents never believed in fanfare. I guess we also didn't have money to <laughs> pay for the fanfare. I think it's both, um, but I remember a special food was prepared. So mm. my mom was asked to make all my special dishes. Oh, how nice. Yes. Wait, uh, you got to tell us one of your special dishes. Fish. Uh, oh. uh, 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 a fish from, uh, a river fish that you get mm. in India. Uh, so I was, not only my mom made all the special dishes, they were also served very traditionally. Mm. Uh, so you have this kind of a big round plate made of eight metals. Mm. And there are eight metal, bo like, uh, so it's called it's ashtadhatu. So every, like, it's not... It's a combination of eight metals, and the mm. and the and all, the entire uh, crockery is made of this eight metal, mm. and then the dishes are served in smaller bowls, and they're laid in a very ritualistic sense because you mm. eat from one side to the other. Beautiful. And then mm. uh, my mom and my dad, mm. um, and remember, I was fifteen; I was a teenager, so you can only imagine how cool I thought this all thing was, right? Mm -hmm. um, they brought uh, traditional lambs. And so my, t my, my teacher, who was now going to give me the next set of instructions, um, we were sitting on the floor. And so we were both sitting. And the food, then my mom and my dad bring like a tradition. We call it a dia, uh, a traditional oil, uh, like a clarified butter lamb. So they place, like you know how you bow to your, yes. to the divine or whatever. So they place that. Then they place the food. And so I'm thinking this teacher is going to eat my favorite dishes, <laughs> right? Like, uh, because I was like, huh? Like, what is happening? And he looks at me and he says, no, you are going to eat today. And I'm not like, you are going, like, it's your turn. Oh. So it's a very big, um, which I understood much later during my PhD, that it is a huge step where your teacher now is saying you are going to be the teacher. So it's kind of like a mantle transfer yes and i understood the intensity of it even more as i said much later during my phd studies is he passed away very oh, soon after he did oh. so i didn't realize then um, that's what it was yeah that that oh. that's what it was but uh, it was much later i understood the significance of that day mm -hmm. but it has stayed with me and you know these now i have a lot more depth to that day, a lot of emotional attachment to the day. At the same time, I laugh because I was more worried about who's going to get to eat that. Who's going <laughs> to eat the fish? <laughs> all the fish and all the stuff that my mom made, which were my favorite dishes, right? So it was kind of funny how how memory gets stored. Yeah, but it's it's also just so lovely because it's like here's the 15 year old kid, like, am I going to get to eat the fish and when? Yeah. And it's also about the the mentor is passing, yeah. the teacher is passing, and giving and, and passing this way of being and this this practice to me like right. this type of initiation to me and it's like this beautiful ritualized way of how and the process of eating these different dishes that mm -hmm. you're taking into your body mm -hmm. like taking in the food taking in the spirit giving you know it, it's beautiful i think that it, something that's fascinating that people don't know about so i'm going to give you three things mm -hmm. <laughs> so bear with me but this there's the practice um, the type of practices in a, in a cremation ground, right? I mean, this is the transformation, transition of the body, mm -hmm. the, uh, of, of dying and, you know, and being in a meditative or type of pr various rituals and practices. I mean, I, that is something I think that's pretty uncommon in the West, right? Like someone dies and you're like, oh, mm -hmm. let's move on. You know, mm -hmm. we're not, we don't deal with it very well at all. I think it's atrocious, but that's another story. Um, but the, these practices in the cremation ground. And then there's also this, the aspect of the transgender deities, which is mm -hmm. so fascinating and gender fluidity um, within the tradition. 
And then there's also the aspect of being a woman and worshiping a goddess mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. practitioners of worshiping a goddess and the role of women, right? Mm -hmm. On the surface, you'd think like women must be revered. Mm -hmm. That must be incredible, mm -hmm. but it's not exactly. No. <laughs> so I know I'm cutting, I mean, looking at three different things here. Um, so I'm going to combine them. Okay. I thought How you about would. that? I thought you would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, you know, it's a podcast. It's not a semester. It's not we get... a semester. Exactly. Um, so let's let's go reverse. Mm -hmm. No, not all the way reverse. I'm going to kind of do a little dance here. Okay, so let's start with a woman worshipping a woman goddess. Mm. Why is that so... Why does it sit in our ears strangely, right? Because w when we leave our body, whatever that is, Atman, soul, whatever term you use, breath, maybe just a breath, mm -hmm. we are genderless. Yes. When we enter the body, we are genderless. Yes. Right? So, and then, you know, we look at things like marriage, and suddenly we we think there is this kind of man woman situation i have sat through few weddings and different traditions every time the person officiating the wedding will say this is meeting of two souls mm, beautiful yeah i've always heard that line and always my brain explodes saying okay meeting of two souls is genderless yes right it is gender fluid so what happens in rituals, it could be engaging with a goddess mm -hmm. or it could be very out there, which is practicing in a cremation ground. And the reason we do Shava Sadhana, not everybody does it. And what, is, I, what does that mean? Shava Sadhana, corpse practice. Oh, wow. Can you explain to us what Shada Sadhana is, this, this corpse practice? So there are many different ways in the tradition that it is done. Um, primarily, it is done to overcome the fear of death. We believe if we have overcome the fear of death, that's the biggest hurdle we have gone past. Yes. And so how this is typically done is um, you are in the cremation ground with burning corpses. So there is a lot of burning flesh smell that is mixed with clarified butter because you know when you are ritualistically burning uh, cremating someone uh, there is um, there are lots of uh, substances that go with it right so there are flowers there are clar there's clarified butter there is wood there is um, a whole bunch of things so but it it kind of produces a very unique smell because there's also the the burning flesh yes and um, and it is n it is a space that is as liminal as it comes, <sighs> right? I don't I don't find another place as liminal. So here, what you do is you are under the guidance of a teacher. You don't do this uh, without guidance, or or you have done it enough, but you'll still do it in a group. You, it's not like you just mm. randomly go into a cremation ground and you start doing it. At least that's not advice. At least that's not the advice I've heard. And essentially what you do is there are many levels of the practice, which I would not want to share in the podcast. Sure. Uh, but essentially what you're doing is you're meditating on death in the cremation ground and you're trying to address, bring forth your fears of death, dying and beyond, and which usually have a lot of emotions attached to it. Yes. Uh, and you're trying to get past one after the other, like kind of just say, okay, can I let go of my family? Can I let go of the attachment to this, attachment to that, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you for, for sharing that. And from what you've also said, it sounds like you've yourself been able to get to a certain place that you feel relatively comfortable with death. Yes. It's a long journey. Yeah, uh, there's a lot to be, there's a lot to be, you know, overcome. Yes. So I'm not, I'm nowhere close to that. But I'm also, when I see some of my friends and family, I would say I'm also a little bit ahead. Mm -hmm. And it's all, um, yeah, it's all about death. 
can I say a joke here? Yes. Okay. So, um, so you know, it's all about that because I, I, I say this in my classrooms always and in my public talks. The fact that we were we are here, we got a grade F, right? <laughs> I mean, remember, I'm I'm Indian. You can bring me out of India, but you can't take Indian out of me. So grades is everything. Uh, uh, B plus is in my mind fail, right? <laughs> it's an F. I know all the books I've read and so on and so forth. But the fact of the matter is, we kind of maybe got F plus, but we did get an F. That's why we came back. <laughs> because if we if we were A, we would have got enlightenment, nirvana. We didn't get it, right? <laughs> so given that we failed, so it's all about get ready so that at least maybe, I know I'm not going to get an A, but maybe I get a D or maybe a... a maybe a B plus. <laughs> maybe a B plus, but still remember it's an F. Right, so, okay. uh, <laughs> so that's why we do these practices. <laughs> All for the grades. <laughs> All for the grades. And I think it's very important. Not everybody can deal with that dying and beyond in that level of um, comfort, right? And, and reverence. And reverence. Like I say, I'm a very bad, like I've learned to be a better Saturday dinner party conversationist <laughs> uh, because I say I love death. I love, like, I love that. Like, what did you do this morning? I went to Houston Hospice and I volunteered there. You know, next thing you know, there are five people who ran away from me because <laughs> you're like, uh, she's a weird one. Um, so, and, but that's my persona. Again, mm. goes back to initiation, right? My persona is I find death, dying, and beyond to be the most generative place Fascinating. the place where i get wow. most information i learn the most from hospice patients i learn the most from seeing things die and wither mm. i get the least from spring for example <laughs> right and also allergies i'm like, ah! like <laughs> you know, my eye is running whatever um but so now comes these rituals all these rituals no matter as intense or as out there as a corpse practice, or it could be a prayer practice in your home with incense and beautiful uh, mantras chanting, right? The idea is to identify the fluidity, mm -hmm. transcend the binary. Wait, can we say that again? To identify the fluidity. Identity, the fluidity and transcend the binary. That's great. And it is not just one binary that you're trying to do, right? Gender is one. Good and bad. Ugly and beautiful. Angry and loving. Day and night. Sun and moon, right? Everything, the minute we have that breath or the vibration, the spandana entered the body, from that moment, the separation began, right? Everything became two. Mm. So now, yes. Tantra is, uh, when we go back to my definition, I said it is about jivana mukti, liberation in this lifetime, right? So achieving some amount of unity in this lifetime is... Is, is tantra is tantra but it, and it's it's that it's liberation and it's enlightenment and it's enlightenment and so i'm somebody who's a very spreadsheet person and a to-do person so i'm like i and i'm also a flawed being let's be very clear i'm no perfect being but for me every new year resolution i take one topic hmm. and it's usually something that is highly contested in the society today and i say where am I January 1st on this debate? Mm. Where will I be? And then every day my meditative practice is only focusing on that binary and seeing have I shifted. Because Ooh. I cannot teach or practice or be in this path if I can't see progression. Right. It's like running on a treadmill, right? If I'm always going to run at three, that's boring. Yeah. At some point, I'll be like, what the hell? Sorry, I, I guess I'm not supposed to use these language edited in podcasts, <laughs> whatever. But, but essentially, for me, it is, it is take, take a topic. 
any topic, anything that you feel passionate about, bring it to your practice and engage with it through these rituals, through these meditative practice. Take that question into the macrocosm mm. because in Tantra, we also believe the blueprint is within us. We were born with the blueprint. Mm. All the answers are with us. It's just that either we have not learned how to read the codes or what I say, sometimes you have to uninstall and reinstall and have a software update. Yeah, definitely. That's all we need to do. The answer is there. And the answer is union, but how do I transcend? So that becomes your every day, every moment practice. And that's where I think I'm very different and mm. sometimes controversial mm. because for a lot of people, they, they don't see Tantra being applied to such mundane tasks. And I am saying, you've got it wrong. I think I need to apply it. And if I don't have, because, you know, otherwise it becomes a very, very big, very wide uh, funnel, right? Yeah. Macrocosm, divine, universe. These become too large of a thing to delve into. But it's it's also saying that, you know, everything is sacred. Absolutely. Like, like everything, like everything. The, the mundane, the profane, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's all... It's all God, so to speak, right? Yeah, because it's, sacred and profane is also binary. It's binary. We were taught and we started seeing that way, right? This is a sacred place. This is a profane place. This is right. a sacred object. This is a... Why? Where, where did where this did come? it come from? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, so... In the, like when you take that sort of you take a topic for example I mean would you be willing to share with us for one of the topics that you've done that kind of work with that you meditate on a binary yeah and uh, how and how you've changed then your perspective over that course of practice yes I will actually take the uh, topic of um, gender identity mm. um, so in India growing up and. This is, again, I'm so happy that I have this orientation more so in the West and having sent my daughter through school and college here. In India, while we have divinities who take on a third gender, we have divinities who cross-dress, we have divinities who, um, who, for a period of time in a year, are a certain gender, another period of time, there will be another gender. So there's all kinds of things happening in mythology, in script, you know, in, in scriptures, in the storytelling, in the oral tradition. When it came to the third gender in India, it largely got bracketed as hijras. Mm. And they were all, I mean, growing up, I saw them in street corners begging or, you know, uh, in uh, sex trade because there was, they were always like shunned. They were, there was just so much going on with that community. Um, Even though it was a aspect of the divinity. Correct, but it was not seen like that. Even, isn't that, what is, uh, see? Yeah. So I decided, and I really um, did not really think about them so much until I started doing my own research and I started meeting them. And then I um, came across an activist. Her name is Lakshmi Narayan Tripathi. Um, and, uh, and then I started reading her books. And then I started meeting more people influenced by her in that community. They, are now, they go by kinners now and not hijras. And I'm so glad for the change in term. But anyway, so then I was like, wait, this is a great example for me. And it took me several years. It didn't happen in one year. But... Every few months, what I realized is, and today I can say this with a lot of confidence, while I take on the she and her as my pronoun, while I, in the society, I move around as a woman, in the gender space, I am true, uh, in the ritual space, I'm truly and completely gender fluid. Mm. So you experience that in practice. And, and that experience is not textbook. No. Something shifts in you. Huh. And it doesn't shift. 
I, I guess it shifts little by little, but there is one moment in the practice when it's almost like, a, you know, a light bulb goes out yeah. and, and suddenly it's like, what, what happened? And then once you have experienced that, once you have experienced that kind of immediate dip into knowledge of yourself in that space, you never go back. Fascinating. You yes, yes. You can never, ever go back to, um, you know, level of whatever you were before that. You're transformed. For yeah, life. it's transformation. And since then, I've started seeing so many aspects of me that are gender fluid. And I'm increasingly becoming comfortable with that space. It's so profound to me because you're saying a couple of things. First of all, it's the you have the experience through a practice or a ritual that is that embodied knowing and learning and it transforms yes. you. And it's like the most profound, not like you said, you can't go back, it's changed you. Everything's wired slightly right. differently, spiritually, physically, whatever you wanna call mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. And it, I just, you know, I, I find that it's fascinating because it's different than, oh, let me read about the latest thing um, on gender and then I'm like kind of like well what okay that makes sense and it's not the same no you you're experiencing from inside out yes and and I don't I don't know how to explain and I guess that's why now I understand why you know uh, experience is better expressed through poetry or yes, through yes. art yes and I have none of those skills <laughs> You like never know. Zilch. Okay. <laughs> as of today, as of this moment, zero skills. I can't even draw a straight line. But maybe for art, you don't need straight line. Who knows? Um, but really, it is something that changes inside of you. Mm-hmm. And it is very real. It is permanent. And you know it. And mm-hmm. you will never forget the moment when that happens. Is it... Is it part of the awakening? I would say yes. Mm-hmm. I would say yes. But I, I, I get a little scared of using the term awakening because, again, in modern West, it almost always gets, it's, it's become synonymous to kundalini. And the kundalini narrative in this country, or actually, in, uh, again, modern West, has become so atypical and so myopic mm. in nature. So awakening, enlightenment, enlightening, I find it a little tricky to use. I haven't yet found the right term, but I would just say hmm. it's a change. And well, it's, it's a, sorry, I didn't mean no. to interrupt you. It's just, it's, it's funny, right? Because it is something that's not really, I mean, you need a, po- maybe you should just write, you need to write your poem to describe what it is Someday. and not find a word. <laughs> Yeah, I need many words to describe <laughs> that, uh, or maybe not, well, or just a haiku. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, but it's it's that there's not really a word for it, and if yeah. you put a word on it, then someone's gonna say like, ah, oh, what are you talking about, exactly. or what's this? Exactly. But you know what? People who have gone through that kind of an experience, they know. They know. Yes, they're like they'll recognize it. Like, oh yes, yes I see, I get it. Yes, yes. So I want to keep talking to you. I'm, I'm noticing a little bit of our time, but uh, there's still so many things to, to say. And of course, as you know, we've just covered some. <laughs> <laughs> um, and to try to choose what to discuss with you. I mean, you know, I, I still find that the transformation and, and looking at the life-death binary and what that transforms into what you've learned from hospice patients is a fascinating topic of conversation. Mm-hmm. And still, like the, the the aspect of the role of women and your work on super women mm-hmm. and the women that you've talked about in the mm-hmm. cremation grounds, very fascinating. Mm-hmm. And you know what? I'm gonna get in trouble with my uh, production team if I don't ask you about Antarctica, <laughs> which people are like, "What Antarctica? Know, yeah, what is the connection?" Tantra and Antarctica. <laughs> but you know, you did this fascinating, fascinating trip, mm-hmm. which to me also comes on the heels of who you are and what you've done and what you've been through. Mm-hmm. And I can't help but wonder what your life experience brought and what was brought to you mm. when you were down with the penguins in Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> Having been with the penguins, uh, yeah, but this is well, a- You just got back. You got back I a ju- month ago, right? 
No, now three weeks ago. Three weeks so, ago. So yeah. Okay. So um, I went for the penguins, but I fell in love with the seals. I think I have not <laughs> seen oh. more lazy, more fat. <laughs> I know these are all very politically incorrect terms to use these days. <laughs> But uh, anyway, I I'm don't think the seals will mind. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Even if they do, uh, it's easy to. What did they say? They say something like it's easy to say sorry than something. Take permission versus apologize. Yes, something like yes, that. yes. I yes. apologize. <laughs> um, no, it was it was fast. So what took me there was, again, questions about death, dying, and ritual. Uh, death, dying, rituals. Because I have come to believe that we, because we've made death as non dinner table conversation. We've lost all knowledge about the space. Yes. And with that knowledge gone, there is this gigantic fear, confusion, anxiety. And then, of course, there's sorrow. When my dad passed away, of course, I was sad. But if I didn't have the tools I had, it would then lead to some kind of breakdowns, right? And I think we have, we've done a great disservice uh, to humanity by making this a non-dinner table conversation. I agree. We need to normalize it. This is life. We are born, we will die. That's it, right? I mean, it's a joke in my family. Like, my daughter is like, oh, I'm going to die. I'm like, yeah, okay, fine. I'll see you on the next uh, other side when I see you. I'm not coming today, <laughs> but I'll see you when I see you, right? Like, we have to normalize it. We have to make it every day. And Wait, I, just people, your daughter's not dying. She's just no, afraid no. of dying. <laughs> okay. No, she's just dramatic. She's very dramatic. You know, it's like that typical 19-year-old, oh, my God, I have so much of homework. I'm going to die today. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, knock on wood. Uh, anyway, uh, so um, so I believe one way to learn very fast is to learn uh, to look at nature. Yes. To look at what happens in nature when, when someone dies, what happens to birds, what happens to, in this case, a penguin, when a penguin knows it is too old to make the journey and go thousands of miles to the other side because the winter is coming, right? What happens then? S or a chick gets eaten, mm -hmm. what happens to the mom, right? What kind of behavior pattern? What are their rituals? What? Are, and I'm a, I love rituals. I think there's a lot to be spoken about rituals. But what are those? So it kind of started with that kind of questioning and kind of wanting to know more. And I would not really get answers because it was like, nothing happens. They get <laughs> old and seals eat them. It's nature. And I'm like, okay, but you know, come on. Like if a chick die, is eaten suddenly, the mother has to feel something, right? So anyway, so it started with that kind of a quest, but I've never been, having been there now, I've never been in water wilderness before of this nature, yes, ever, yes. ever. And I'm still processing, but I can tell for a fact that it really my subtle boy, my elements, my five elements got very strangely stirred up. Mm -hmm. I have never, so I love mountain climbing. I've gone up to 20,500 feet, 18,500 wow. feet. So I love that. Like, so I know what happens to my subtle body when I go mount on mountains. I did not know what happens when you go on, in, on water wilderness for that long. Wow. And I can tell for a fact that something again has changed in wow. me and it is not physical there is something at a s elemental level at a tatva level that has shifted mm. and i think again it's it'll come i will get a better sense of it over time but it was magical it was you know, there was a very different connect to the universe and the cosmos, mm. which I had never experienced before. And it is magnificent to wow. see the icebergs, the animals, no land for days together, for hundreds of miles together, uh, just water and water and more water. Frozen water. And frozen the water. The base of the planet. and Everything. And I think that's another thing, right? When you go to the base of the planet, I think the gravitational force and the uh, magnetic oh. force shifts. Hmm. And I know it has shifted in me. Wow. But I just don't know. What does that mean, right? I mean, there has to be a reason. Yeah. 
Mm. But I think the answer has not come, and I can't be the microwave generation. I have to wait. You have to <laughs> wait. It has to unfold. Yes. yes. Wow. It's an incredible, an incredible experience and story. Um, would you say that it was a prof- one of the most, I mean, I guess a question of a pr- moment of profound wonder or awe in your experience was yes there? this is a this is a different level of wonder yeah i've i think i've normal you know i've had so many of these in the past uh, so many of atypical ones in the past that i think it became normative mm-hmm. uh, and i always like you know when i saw you know, you know, the name of your podcast, Wonderstruck, I was like, was I ever struck by wonder? Like, you know, like what? <laughs> All that time. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah, so it becomes normalized, yeah. but uh, it became normative for me. But I think Antarctica and it was, it's, it is very, um, the shift is very real and something has shifted in me. And I know these things happen when the time is right, the place is right, and the moment is right. And, you know, these things happen for a reason. Yes. Uh, and I am truly wonderstruck right now. And, mm. and, I, and I will remain wonderstruck. And that's my promise is to not overthink, overanalyze. Just to be in it. Just to enjoy it. It's yes. a blessing. Yes, it it's, is a blessing. To be wonderstruck is also an immense blessing. So, I want to remain wonderstruck for some time with this May experience. You. May we all. <laughs> May we all. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> yes. Thank you so, so much, Ravana. I can't tell you how wonderful it is for you to be here on the podcast. I've really enjoyed listening to you, asking you questions, talking to you during this time. So thank you. That was Sravana Borkataki Varma. Thank you so much, Sravana. To learn more about Sravana's work, check out sravana.me. Please come back next time on Wonderstruck when I'll be talking with Radha Agrawal about community building and why she believes dance is the most healing technology that we have. For more information about Wonderstruck, our guests, and some really exciting upcoming events, check out wonderstruck.org. And please follow the show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and subscribe on YouTube. We truly want to hear from you with your feedback, reviews, and ratings. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook at Wonderstruck Pod. Wonderstruck is produced by Wonderstruck Productions, along with the teams at Bailey Newman and Freetime Media. Special thanks to Brian O'Kelly, Ileana Eleftheru, Travis Reese, and Tom Camuso. Thank you for listening. And remember, be open to the wonder in your own life. Mm-hmm.